All right, welcome back to ABA exam review in our BCBA task list series, continuing with concepts and principles. B14, provide examples of verbal operants. Verbal operants can be as complex as you want to make it. I mean, Skinner wrote entire books on verbal operants. It's one of the defining features of his radical behaviorism theory. So it can get really, really complex for the exam and really in practice, you want to simplify it as much as possible. Okay. And that's what we're going to try to do today. So as always, check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. When you pass, please let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out, work hard, study hard. Let's get going. So verbal behavior consists of verbal operants, right? We have a speaker, we have a listener, and as they go back and forth, their behavior is evoked by different things. It's reinforced by different things. And that is verbal behavior. Now we have our verbal operants, our primary verbal operants, mans, intraverbals, texts, echoics, transcriptions, textuals, and then autoclitics down here at the bottom kind of go along with the primary verbal operants. So when thinking about what verbal operant am I dealing with, always consider what is evoking it and what is reinforcing it. And you've got to consider point-to-point -point correspondence and formal similarity. So formal similarity is referring to what in verbal behavior? Well, point-to-point -point correspondence means whatever is verbally stated is identical between either the speaker and the listener, or whether you're reading a sign word for word, that is point-to-point, -point. okay? The response is identical and whatever is spoken or said or written. Formal similarity is talking about topography, how the how the response looks. So written and written, spoken and spoken, those are formally similar. So formal similarity is referring to what? A, how the verbal behavior looks from the speaker and listener. Yes, we're concerned with the form of the verbal behavior. B, what the speaker and listener are communicating. No, that's more along the lines of point-to-point -point correspondence. C, the function of the verbal behavior. Well, we do analyze verbal behavior based on function, but that is not what we talk about when talking about formal similarity. And then D, the magnitude. We're not concerned with the magnitude. We're concerned with the form, the topography. What does it look like? If it looks the same, it has formal similarity. So let's get started on the operants. First, the man, probably maybe the most well-known, right? Maybe a coex, but typically you're going to hear man a lot, especially if you work with the younger children. So a man is a request. You're asking for information. You're seeking wants and needs. It's evoked by a motivating operation. That's very important to remember. The distinguishing feature of a man is it isn't evoked by verbal SDs. And it's evoked by a motivating operation, right? There is a motivating operation working on responses for a temporarily increase, a temporary increase in a response, right? The behavior altering effect because the value of something has gone up. Typically, we think of being thirsty or hungry when we think of man's, and it goes for really anything. So it's reinforced by receiving the requested item. So if you're man training, whatever they man for, you want to give to them. So what is your name? You're asking for information about the name. There's a motivating operation there. Give me the pencil and leave me alone or all types of motivating operations. Or I mean man's, right? Again, the defining feature of a man is it's evoked by a motivating operation, and then you reinforce by giving the requested item. So again, a man is evoked by what of the following? Not a verbal SD, not a nonverbal SD, a C, a motivating operation. And I'm emphasizing that because that really is the primary characteristic that you're going to start identifying mans by. Then we have tax, so labeling, naming a stimulus, identifying a stimulus. Evoked by a nonverbal SD. And this nonverbal part is important, right? We're talking about objects and tangibles and things in the environment that are not verbal that are evoking these words. Most common, let's say a vehicle drives by, you say car, or you say plane, or you're riding in a car, you look outside, you say horse or cow or farm or whatever it might be, right? These nonverbal SDs are evoking this labeling behavior. Tax are evoked by a generalized condition reinforcer. Now, generalized condition reinforcers are stimuli that have reinforcing properties that are effective in multiple 
scenario. So a lot of op verbal operant training involves these generalized condition reinforcers, a lot of operant training in general, right? And then this idea of impure tax, okay? An impure tax is evoked by both a MO and a nonverbal SD. So you're essentially manding and tacting at the same time. For example, let's say you need fuel riding with your friend. So the motivating operation, right? The motivation is you need gas, okay? You drive, you drive by a gas station, you point and say, gas station on your right. The impure tact is saying, you tacted because an MO was present. Would you have said gas station on your right if the MO wasn't present? And that's the impure tact. There are no impure mans. They're just impure tacts. So which of the following stimuli could function as a generalized conditioned reinforcer? A, money. Yes. B, praise. Yes. And C, tokens. All the above. That's the great thing about generalized conditioned reinforcers, right? They're portable. They're easy to use. And they can be used in a variety of situations. Then the echoics, right? Echolalia. Speaker repeats what was heard. Phrases and words and lines from movies and songs and just over and over and over again to an atypical extent, and they don't stop even when told. So evoked by a verbal SD, right? So they hear a verbal uh, SD, and they or they, they see a verbal SD or whatever it is, and they just repeat it over and over again. Reinforced by a generalized condition reinforcer. So if you're a coic training, you can reinforce with any sort of reinforcer available. There is point-to-point -point correspondence, meaning whatever the speaker is saying is identical to the verbal SD that evoked it. So the phrase must be identical. The song lyric, the word, whatever it is, it must be identical. And there's also formal similarity. So this is a key here because it really distinguishes echoics and introverbals. Because this is typically saying, well, if there's formal similarity, then this this is really almost really going to be a vocal SD, right? Someone saying something, the speaker repeating it word for word. Word for word is point to point. And then formal similarity is spoken and spoken. Very important to understand that. The echoed response is exactly what was heard, delivered in exactly the same way. So which of the following examples represents formal similarity? Okay, formal similarity, meaning delivered the same way. I say go home, you wave goodbye. Nope, not formally similar. I write, you write. See, all we have to do is identify the form. Yes, I say you sign, no. I text, you say, no. The only form that is similar is B. I write and you write. Introverbal, speaker responds to someone, conversation, answering questions. Again, evoked by a verbal SD, okay? So you you read something, you somebody tells you something, you read a text, whatever it is, a speaker is responding to that verbal SD and is reinforced from the listener or social reinforcement. Okay, so social reinforcement is typically involved in this introverbal operant. Now, there is no point-to-point -point correspondence, meaning if I say, what's your name, and you say, what's your name, that is an echoic. If I say, what's your name, and you say, Alex, that is an introverbal. Now, it can have formal similarity. It may, it just depends. But there is no point to point correspondence, which is really distinguishing it from a coex. So which of the following is an example of an interverbal? So remember, when identifying different operants, remember what is evoking it? What is reinforcing it? Point to point, formal similarity. A writing dog after someone asks for your favorite animal. Okay, so is there a formal similarity? No, there's no point to point correspondence, okay, but you are responding to someone writing about asking about your favorite animal, okay, and if there is going to be reinforced from the listener. So A is an interverbal. B, saying pizza after someone asks what you want for lunch. Again, there is formal similarity. It can have form, formal similarity. There is no point-to-point -point correspondence evoked by a verbal SD, so B, yes. C, saying, I don't believe it, to your friend after reading a text message, evoked by a verbal SD, no point-to-point -point correspondence, assumingly, and formal similarity, no, but that's okay. So actually, all three of these, because they're all evoked by a verbal SD, without point-to-point -point correspondence, and they're going to involve listener social reinforcement.
Textual, reading books, signs, written text, text, etc. Okay, so evoked by written verbal SDs. You're essentially reading, right? Now, again, important because distinguishing from a, let's say, an intraverbal, there is point-to-point -point correspondence and there is no formal similarity. So you can see why these are the most important factors in trying to identify the difference between all these different operands. All right. So textual is essentially reading evoked by written verbal SDs. There's point to point correspondence, meaning you're reading exactly what is written, but there is no formal similarity. Reading is not formally similar to the written word. Which of the following is an example of point to point correspondence? So again, point to point essentially means word for word. Think of it like that. You read out loud a sign that says no running. Well, if you read that sign word for word, there is point to point. B, you say a donut when asked what you want for breakfast. It's not word for word. It's not point to point. You say the color red when someone says, say red. It's not word for word. Not point to point. The answer is A. That's the only one that is word for word. And then transcriptions is just taking dictation. So evoked by a verbal SD in some form. Okay, you're reinforced by a generalized condition to reinforcer. There's point to point correspondence. So you are transcribing exactly what the verbal SD is presenting you with. Okay, and there's no formal similarity. Remember, verbal and vocal are two different things. Verbal behavior is just communication, right, between a speaker and a listener. Spoken, written, signed picture cards. These are verbal communication. Vocal is spoken. Okay, There's a difference between being nonverbal and nonvocal. There's a lot of people out there who are verbal, especially people who, let's say, use sign language. They are very verbal. They're just not vocal. Very important to distinguish between these two ideas. Duplex and codex. Now, duplex and codex and then autoclitics we're going to give a brief overview, and you want to understand these at a very basic level. Now, if you're very interested in it, then as by all means, go deeper into it. But you just want to be careful because it can get confusing. Okay. So if we're talking about duplex, right, we're repeating something with formal similarity. So the form is the same echoes, right? Formal similarity. Motor imitation, formal similarity. Copying text. Formal similarity. Codex, on the other hand, okay, repeating something with no formal similarity. So textuals, okay, or transcriptions. So that's really the difference here, okay? Duplex and codex, okay, they're both repeating something, but duplex, there's formal similarity. Codex, there is not. And then autoclitix, you're describing your own verbal behavior. Right. Think about you manning for something, tacting for something, and you're describing your own manned or tact. Okay. Saying it's a red truck versus I think it's a red truck. That I think is describing your own verbal behavior of red truck. So you're basically combining a operant with a secondary response and you're providing context around why you engaged in a particular verbal operant. That's about as simple as I can make it. You're describing your own verbal behavior. You're giving context. And that's really probably where you want to land for now on autoclitics, especially as you study and prepare. If you get to the point in your prep where you think you're 100% fluent in everything else and you feel extremely confident, then feel free to get deeper into autoclitics and codex and duplex. But you really want to understand these on a surface level and make sure you've got everything else really down pat before trying to get deeper into autoclitics because it can get very, very complex. It's a very complex topic. All right. So autoclitics, describing your own verbal behavior, you're providing context. There's a secondary response associated with the primary verbal response that just gives context around you why you why you said something, essentially. Okay. So that's verbal operants. Simplistic way of looking at it. Yes, but that's what we do here, right? We try to simplify these things. Okay. You have to simplify it at first. Because if you try to not you try to learn it without simplifying it first, 
it's going to become a lot dip, more difficult to retain it, to get fluent in it, fluency in it. Once you get a, a, a good foundation, then you get a more complex understanding. Okay, remember, all these things are foundational. Once we have the foundation, we can start to develop a much deeper understanding of these ideas. As always, check out BehaviorAnalystStudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. As always, let us know when you pass, work hard, study hard. See you soon.